Uh, I'm highly frustrated with my phone. I'm not. Uh, I'm not a techie. I don't know all that type of stuff, and so my phone storage won't let me record videos. And uh, I'm able to record this video because I had to go through a whole bunch of stuff just to be able to upload a video to make everyone aware what's wrong. Uh, because I, I think I only posted one video yesterday, and I'm trying to keep this story going so that I can uh, just let everyone know the whole uh, trip of those 17 moves that I went through during those 14 years and two months. So now, um, as I explained in the last video, I made it down to OCC segregation. So five days later, they came and got me and took me down to D&E. And then I stayed in D&E for about five weeks. Uh, I seen some familiar faces, met some new faces. Uh, and I was just, like I said, I was just extremely happy to be back in Nebraska. Arizona is a different world. But to be able to see my parents and family and have them coming to visit me like they did down in Arizona, I do it all over again for that. Uh, so when I got to NSP, uh, they put me out in building eight. And when I originally left, NSP in 1994, there was no building eight. Uh, it only went one through six. And, uh, you know, six is a uh, is T dorm. Uh, you know, now they got some drug programs back there. Anyway, uh, so they put me back in eight. I didn't like eight because it's open bay. And after all those years of being in two man cells, I uh, was used to that. So I put in a request to the captain and I asked him to have me placed back up front. Uh, they call it the inside. I wanted to go back to the inside. And uh, so they put me back in building one where I was originally before I ever left NSP. And then uh, they put me in a room with one of my homeboys, uh, Killer, that's Anthony, and uh, my guy Kirkland. So they, uh, put me in there with him, we was good sellers, you know what I'm saying, we was uh, friends from childhood, and uh, that still is my friend, you know, anyway, I uh, was up there with him for a number of weeks, I remember, uh, I remember I bought a Walkman, a cassette player, a Walkman off the yard for 10 tokens, and when I bought the Walkman, uh, it didn't take batteries, the part inside of the Walkman but the batteries was, was broken. And uh, so it came with a, uh, a DC adapter and, and some headphones. So I paid 10 tokens for it, you know. And at this point, I hadn't had no write-ups. I hadn't had a write-up in you know, like over eight years. And so uh, I started uh, using it. And one of my homeboys uh, named Willie Tucker, he, uh, he seen that I had that. And he asked me, you know, where I got it from. And I told him, and he, he encouraged me to get rid of it because when you have a sentence like mine, 11 to life, they, the parole board wants you to do your last three years before they will consider getting you a, a release date set. They want you to have your last three years served with no misconduct reports. So I was about eight years with no misconduct reports at this point, so Willie, didn't want to see me get uh, anything to mess up that uh, that track record. So I ended up selling it to this dude named Barfield, told him that uh, it don't take batteries, told him all that, whatever, explained it, and here's how it goes. I sold it to him for 10 tokens, just like I bought it for 10 tokens. So anyway, uh, after a while, some dude come knocking on my door talking about, uh, hey, uh, uh, Barfield want to talk to you. Uh, I think he mad. I don't care. So, uh, anyway, I threw on my sweats and some boots and double, double laced, uh, or, or I'm sorry, double knotted my boots and double knotted my sweatpants and threw on a tank top or a t-shirt, one of the two. And I went on down there to see what he talking about because that's who I sold it to, right? So I get down there. He talking about, man, I never thought you, I never thought you would do uh, something like this, man. I never thought it would be like that with us. I said, what you talking about? Oh, this thing don't even work. I said, it do too work. No, it don't work. I said, where is it at? It's, it's in my room. 
I said, go get it. So he went and got it. He comes back with it. I plug it in. I press play. It don't come on. So I'm thinking, man, what's wrong with this thing? So I flip it over and I look at the back of it. Uh, and there's a little switch that says AC, EC, you know, uh, alternate cur uh, current, direct current. So the batteries don't work. So it won't, it won't be on AC. It needs to be on direct current. So when I look back at it, he uh, at some point had switched it to AC for whatever reason. Why? Why? I don't know. So it wouldn't come on. Never mind that it was working when you had it on DC. All you got to do is put it back on DC. Never mind that. So anyway, as soon as he showed me, uh, uh, you know, I plugged it in and all that I was telling you. And then I, I switched it back to DC. And because I had already pressed play, as soon as I went... Uh, to DC mode, music started coming through the headphones. And then I just set the Walkman down on the table and started walking away. And I told him, I said, man, I ain't never been shady. I ain't never been grimy. I ain't, that don't run with my name. I don't do no petty stuff like that or whatever, you know. Then, uh, uh, that was about it, you know what I mean, whatever. So, uh, I, uh, I, uh, eventually, shortly after all that, they came and talked to me and told me that uh, the staff came and talked to me and told me I got to be moved to Tecumseh. Uh, and I sent Tecumseh, Nebraska. And at that time, that was new as well. Like, Tecumseh didn't exist before uh, I went down to Arizona. So they placed me in Tecumseh eventually. And uh, when I get up there, I think I told y'all in some earlier videos that Tecumseh was built to, uh, to imitate the uh, demographics of writing unit down there in Arizona, Florence, Arizona, and I'm in complex. So when I got on the yard, right when I came onto the yard, though I had never been in Tecumseh, I looked and I knew where everything was right away. Like right when I looked in, my mind was telling me, medical's over here, you know, this is gonna be the education, the library, the dining hall, the laundry. You know, and I'm looking at everything, and I'm thinking, man, why, you know, why is this so, so familiar, you know, whatever. So eventually, uh, uh, I forgot how I recalled that uh, they came down to Arizona's prisons. The staff, some officials came down to Arizona's prisons. Uh, prisons. They traveled around, and they went to a few different places, and so they, uh, uh, they traveled around, went to a few different places, and they uh, they decided, you know, they liked the uh, format from from a writing unit. So anyway, up at Tecumseh, when I got there, it was still fairly new. It had a whole bunch of occupancy available, and uh, but however, it was still very violent. There was bloodshed every single day that I was there. Just about every single day, there was bloodshed, and. Uh, I seen fights. I seen a dude named Troy die, uh, leaning up against the wreck shack. He died uh, from a heart attack. But this lieutenant that was standing right there by him, it was hot that day. And this lieutenant that was standing right there by him while he was having this heart attack, mind you, this lieutenant is a uh, staff uh, in the security side, not the medical side. But anyway, he go he gets on the radio and tells medical they don't need to rush to get over here to him. He's, he's merely suffering from heat exhaustion. That's what he said. He's merely suffering from heat exhaustion. So medical stopped running and they walked on over there. By the time they got there and got him on the gurney and all this sort of stuff, it was over with. He died from a heart attack. And he was an interstate compact inmate from Iowa. And so for some reason he died up there at Tecumseh. And uh, I wrote his family and sent them a card and I told them that uh, I heard the lieutenant tell medical they don't need to hurry and uh, and that it, had he not said that that may have changed the whole situation because they probably could have gave him some adrenaline you know something like that and got his heart back uh, 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 stabilized or something but either way that happened and uh, I remember one time I was in I think I was in building two at Tecumseh and uh, I'm sitting out front on this bench and there's this native dude with this real long hair, kind of a you know hefty dude. I forgot his name now anyway, but uh, I probably wouldn't say his name because of what he had done, but 
he was sitting there and these two old white dudes had been walking the track. And I guess, uh, the, you know, as the story goes, those two white guys were pedophiles. And uh, so as they kept making their laps, this Indian guy, uh, native guy was like, uh, when they come back around here, I'm gonna hit one of them with one of these rocks. And uh, he picked up because the concrete, you know, like I said, Tecumseh was fairly new. So all the concrete that had been poured, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with a little bit of the excess spillage of concrete will be next to the pour and then to just harden and turn into rock. So he picked up one of those flat stones and these people are coming. Here they come. They're getting closer and closer. And this dude used to play uh, baseball. So this dude stands up and he's acting like he's on a pitcher's mound. And uh, he's acting like he's checking the bases and everything. And these two dudes go right in front of the pod. And this dude rears up and throws that thing with all he got. And he hit this white guy right behind his ear. And his glasses flew off. But immediately, right when he hit him, you could just see blood start pouring down his neck. Immediately, he put his hand there. It started coming through his fingers. And he looked over toward where it came from. And because he didn't have his glasses on, he couldn't he couldn't narrow in on you know anyone. And the other guy that was walking with him was looking for the glasses and picked them up. But anyway, uh, that guy when he turned toward us, he said, he said, who did that? He, he said, I'm telling, <laughs> just like that, like, I'm telling, and straight up, that man made a beeline straight across the center, going straight toward uh, the lieutenant's office, or whatever, but uh, that was just funny to me, though, because that dude threw that rock, dead aim, like, and just hit that guy right behind his ear, you know what I mean, but anyway, uh, so that was that, but uh, I've seen other fights and all that type of stuff up there happen and uh nothing to glorify whatever uh but what i was seeing most of all up there were the people like i said they were sending lifers up there so the people over here in uh, tecumseh now especially the majority of people in tecumseh will never see daylight again they'll, they'll never get out and that's the reason why tecumseh is so wild and violent because they have no reason to have any hope. So when I come back on here, I want to talk something about that, about just what it's like to be around people that have no hope and uh, how can you expect them to behave when they don't have anything to behave for, at least they don't believe that they do. So when I come back on here, I want to talk to you about some of that and some of these other uh, matters that's been on my mind. But I'm happy that I was able to make this video. Uh, I'm gonna keep messing with my phone to clear up my storage. And I'll pop back on here today, all right.